text this morning if you take your Bibles. Matthew chapter 28. As we like to say, share your neighbor with your Bible. Matthew 28, Romans 12. Both of them very familiar scriptures. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our Father, we thank you for this assembly. We thank you for this third Sunday of November. We realize that the seasons are changing. We realize that it brings a threat to our comfort, yea, even to our health and well-being. Thank you for the confidence we have that the Lord is with us. Bless those who need your touch for illness, Minister special, even in the house today, for those who come with spiritual need. Above all, give glory to yourself. We love you for it, as you anoint your word in the ears of the hearers to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. How many of you... Uh, know the name Joseph Goebbels. Raise your hand. You're familiar with that name. There got to be one, somebody. Well, I trust that you will remember the name better uh, as I tell you a story. There was a leader of the free world. I guess I shouldn't even call him leader in the free world, just a leader in the world, who was facing death. He was near the end of his life. In fact, he was guilty of suicide. He had had multitudes, yea, millions of persons who had been his followers, his fans, who echoed his message and allowed him to inflict what turned out to be punishment upon multitudes of people. It was his aim to annihilate the Jewish race. But he had a disciple. We had had a number of them, but this late in his life, most of them had utterly and totally forsaken him. Ran off, ran away. Did not want to be identified with him, for they knew the end was near. That leader's name was Adolf Hitler. 
and the name of the one disciple who stayed with them to the end was Joseph Gobo. That's right. He believed in Adolf Hitler. His heart belonged to his leader. The other day, somebody asked me, what really is your heart? Is it how you feel with your emotions? Is it your affection? What, 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 what's bound up with your heart? As simple as I can phrase it, when you talk about a person's heart, you are talking about their mind, their emotions, all right, and their will. And when you put them all together in terms of how they will work, you will understand something of what we're talking about when we talk about a man's heart. Your mind not only goes in that direction, but also your emotions and your decision-making power all are working together. And, and this man's heart, his mind, his emotions, and his will were bound up together and totally devoted to Adolf Hitler. His heart, as I said, belonged to his leader. In fact, Goebbels late in life made this statement. We shall go down in history as the greatest statesman in the history of the world, or we will go down in history as the greatest criminals in the history of the world. Goebbels was a true disciple of Adolf Hitler, a student who trusted and emulated whatever his leader had taught him and practiced before him. He was a disciple even though his heart was never transformed. I want to talk about discipleship. Name some disciples for me. James? John? Peter? Peter? Oh, yeah. That's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll get to them. But the truth of it is, I want you to know something today. Three things I guess I want to say and I'll be done. Number one is, every person who has ever lived is a disciple. I want you to get that in your mind, in your head. We, we so often biblically think Jesus had 12 disciples, all right? And, and, and we also often think that Jesus created this thing of discipleship, not true. I want you to understand how it functions, not only in his day and time, but I want you to understand how it's supposed to function in our day and time. As I said, every person who's ever lived is a disciple. The, the, the Greek word uh, for uh, disciple is a simple word called mathetes, M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S. And it simply means a learner or a student. That's why, that's why Jesus, knowing how people are and what happens in our lives, uh, in, 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 in Luke's uh, gospel, there are these words that come to us from our Lord. In, in chapter 6 of Luke, uh, Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall in the, into the ditch? A disciple is not above uh, his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Jesus knew that every person 
every person is a disciple. And so he says, you are going to follow somebody or you're going to follow something, some entity, some uh, group of teachings. Something's going to shape your life. You're going to be a disciple uh, thereof. And he says, just know you will become like your leader. Even if that shaper of your life is not only someone, it can be something. What do I mean by that? We are often shaped by our culture. Okay? And whatever our culture says, that's what uh, we wind up doing. I thought I saw her down front, but she's somewhere here. I, I looked in the youth choir last Sunday, and uh, a quick glance back that way as I came in, and I said, oh, uh, looks like they got a new member in the youth choir. But it wasn't a new member. It was one of the old members with a whole bunch of new hair. All right? Now, 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 mind you, I, in the last month time, I've been uh, to Washington, I've been to New York, and, and I was not surprised by what I saw here because I saw it in the fashion capitals of the uh, nation as well because hair is the in thing these days. You get dreads, huh? Yeah. Uh, you get braids. Uh, that, that, that's the in thing today. You, you, some of you sisters need to trade in them weeks for some new ones here now. Uh, there's a new style uh, that's going on. <laughs> All right. Now, because our culture shapes so much of the decisions that we make. All right? Uh, we have to understand it's nothing new. It's always been true. Uh, when, when, when I was a boy, I can still remember, uh, right, we, we um, wore a kind of shoe called clod hoppers. Huh? Oh, yeah, some of you all know about clod hoppers, all right? Yeah, okay. Now, now, listen, but we're so shaped by our society. So by the time I got to junior high school, all right, I was ashamed of my clod hoppers. The clod hoppers were big old country looking things and they even came part where you didn't have to wear no boots. Those clod hoppers of snow couldn't even get inside of them. Now, now what I would do though was uh, back then uh, the saints uh, had, uh, and, and you heard conversation about it, we had our Sunday clothes. How many of y'all remember your Sunday clothes? All right, sure. Any over 60 ought to remember how it was back in the day. And uh, we had Sunday shoes. I didn't have to wear my clod hoppers on Sunday. I had some Sunday shoes, nice uh, kind of shoes, like, uh, you know, modern shoes and up-to-date shoes. The problem was times were changing uh, back then, and, and uh Clawed hoppers were no longer acceptable. But I couldn't take my Sunday shoes to, church, to school because they were only for church, and my parents wouldn't allow me. So I had to figure something out. You know what I did? I put my Sunday shoes in my gym bag, all right? And I would carry my gym bag to school, all right? Now, my mama couldn't figure out how do you have gym every day? You even like you carry your gym bag to school every day. I didn't have gym every day. I had my Sunday shoes in my gym bag. And so by the time when I got to school, went straight to my locker, took off them cloud hoppers, and put my Sunday shoes on and strutted all around school that day. All right? Why? Because my culture, my the context was what I was observing and carrying out. There are folks that may be sitting in here today that got on yesterday's fashion, and there are others who take note of that. 
and wonder, do we need to help brother or sister so and so out? Um, because we are affected by, our lives are shaped by whatever causes us to arrive at the decisions we arrive at. Everybody is a disciple. I, I want you to get that in your heads and understand. Point number two. There is only one leader who is able to transform his disciples. You see, as I said, Jesus um, was in a, a society, uh, among the Jews especially, uh, they were already into discipleship long before Jesus came on the scene. Back then, in that culture, there were rabbis traveling all over uh, the countryside. They were everywhere. Their learners were impacted by both knowledge and skills that were learned from all of these rabbis, the teachers in Israel who traveled all over the place. The problem was their hearts had not been transformed. As I said, everyone is a disciple of somebody or something. But most disciples have never been transformed. Only one leader is able to bring transformation. That's why we in the church have a hold of something the world doesn't really have. The question becomes, how are we using it? Or are we using it at all? Most churches desire to have members. Most churches uh, desire to have large numbers of people. Most churches believe that our responsibility uh, is to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Our problem is that we don't seem to quite understand what Jesus has really said is the real mission and purpose of the church. He says to us, plainly and simply, as the gospel brings it out for us, go make converts. No, that's not what he said. Somebody ought to shake that thing right. Shake your head, no. That's not what he said. What did he say do? Go make disciples. There's a world of difference between a convert and a disciple. And the difference is in the heart of that individual. All right? No wonder Paul writing and says, be not conformed to this world. Confirmation, as I said, to confirm something is simply to act in accord with a standard that's set there. And so Paul says, if, if we're going to have a church, we cannot be conformed to this world. What then, Paul, should happen to us? Paul makes it plain, you have to be transformed. And transformation is not simply confessing Christ as your personal savior. Most of us have this idea and notion that once we are converted, we have professed Christ uh, as our personal savior, and we even have songs about it. You know, I uh, know I've been changed. Uh, really, we, we, we want to testify uh, because I've accepted Christ as my personal Savior. But over and over again, the Bible is trying to get across to us, there's got to be something beyond that. Because Paul says plainly and simply, not only does he uh, give us the negative, be not, do, do not be conformed to this world, but what does he say? Be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, yes. You got to have a new mind. You got to have a new mind. I, I don't care how dumb you are or how smart you are. 
you still need a new mind. I don't care whether you've been raised in the church or had never heard of Jesus before, you still need a renewing of your mind. There's something that needs to happen. And I'm saying again, we need uh, in the body of Christ to lift it up again. Only one leader brings transformation. Discipleship, discipleship, I don't care who that person may, discipleship apart from Jesus is non-transformational. It may provide education, it may improve your behavior, it may even increase your happiness or make you feel more skilled at something that you're doing. But, but, but these are just changes. You are still the same on the inside. Jesus is the only rabbi who can change life at its very core. And I want to talk about that for just a few moments here. I want you to ask yourself a simple question. Say it out loud with me. Has Christ informed me or transformed me? It's a key question you need to ask yourself today. Yeah. If you really uh, want a change uh, that gets to the core of who you are, you, you have to make some basic decisions, my friend. Yeah. You see, when, 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 when most churches take in new members, they expect conformity or, or behavior modification, okay? Um, you, 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 you're part of this body now. I, I still remember uh, years ago, late 60s, early 70s, whenever it was, um, a, a gentleman that, uh, he was a professor at the university, and he uh, came uh, to church and gave his heart to Christ, and I uh, was so happy about that. Uh, but I took special note of him, and I uh, watched him. When he first came to us, I had observed enough of his life to know he had certain habits of the flesh. Well, Mike, he was still smoking, for example. And uh, I didn't say anything to him. Uh, but a few months later, I um, had noticed that I neither saw the package nor did I detect the odor emanating from it. And so I, I um, uh, said to him, uh, Doc, you, 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 you don't seem to smoke anymore. And he said, no, I don't. I said, uh, what brought about that change? And he said, observation. What do you mean observation? I knew where he was going. He said, I simply looked around this place and I discovered the people here don't smoke. I didn't, he himself, I didn't see nobody smoking. He said, the church I was raised in, the folks I'm used to being around, they couldn't wait till the benediction to get out in the parking lot and, and, and light up. But he said, there was no lighting up in your parking lot. So I just realized, he said, that the members of this church don't smoke. So I said, hey, I want to be a part of that church, and I want to be an acceptable member of that church. So he quit smoking. Now, we, we know churches, what's that old phrase? Uh, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't chew, and I don't hang around folks who do. Um, we have a style of life that's typical of any group that you're going to be a part of, okay? And, and basically, it's behavior modification. If you're going to be among us, don't cuss. And you new members, I'm giving you warning. Um, don't, don't, don't even use the name of Jesus in vain. Not, not around here. Uh, we, we, we ain't like that. We don't talk that way. Uh, you don't uh, um, do those things, right? Uh, you, 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 you change your behavior when you are here. Uh, you drop some of them words you used to use and you learn a good spiritual language. You learn how to praise the Lord. 
you don't answer, I'm fine. I'm blessed and highly favored. It's what you uh, let folks know. Uh, you know, you, you, you change your language and, 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 and all. Why? Because that's what they do in this place. Our problem is we've settled for a Christianity that's not biblical. We, we've settled for a relationship that's not what Jesus really wants to offer to people and what he makes possible for us. Jesus is in a greater business than simply modifying the behavior of people. Jesus is a, the only one who is able to get to the very root and core of who you are and transform you into an entirely new person. And, and, and listen, don't think, I know it's a special thing that happens when you confess Christ as your savior, but don't ever get the notion and the idea that that's the ultimate as far as Christianity is concerned. That simply gets you on the path that can carry you to really being a transformed individual. That's why attitudes are still difficult things in the house of God. That's why some folk who conform to all of our usual standards and measure up to those things very well. Nobody can put a finger on their life, but they have never been transformed in their heart. I, I want somehow to get across to you that, that uh, this church and this people of God can genuinely be a transformed people. Now, I know there are some of us that are not the best examples in the world, but I want you to know I at least want you to be trying. I want to be changed. I want to be transformed. I want to have a different personality. I'm not going to be what I've been before. You see, people who have their sins forgiven can still be as mean and ornery as they've ever been. They can be as argumentative and difficult to get along with as anybody else in the world. But people who have been transformed have a whole change in their attitude and in their approach. I would to God that uh, we, we could repent of having allowed folks to just have their sins forgiven and then modify their lives to live like our standards are at First Church of God. I wish we could bring you to a place of seeing and you are in Christ now. And Christ Jesus makes it possible for you to not merely conform to a church's standard, but to enable you to be transformed in your basic heart and be like Jesus. It's possible for us. One more point. Let me answer that question. Has Christ informed you or transformed you? You see, if, 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 you, if you really want a change that gets to the core of who you are, you have to make some basic decisions. Uh, you see, as I said, when, when, when most churches take in new members, we expect them to conform to our standards, the kind of behavior we expect of you. But Jesus isn't merely interested uh, in you changing your appearance or changing your behavior. You, 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 for the church's sake, you got to change your appearance. You, you have to realize that uh, some of you all who come to the Lord uh, can't come to church and with what you used to wear to them places you used to go, okay? And we used to teach against wearing pants, but truth of it is, the pants have saved a number of y'all from rebuke in the house of the Lord. And so we, we, are, we are opening up a bit uh, on those things. But, but I'm trying to say to you uh, today that, that it's got to be beyond appearance or behavior. Christ wants to change your mind. He wants to change your emotions. He wants to, to change your will. Transformation uh, is more than 
surface level alterations. You see, the essence of transformation is not merely more knowledge and information about all that uh, Jesus commanded, but the truth of it is transformation is obedience to all that Jesus commanded. Um, let, me, let me use a bit at length here, um, just a couple of moments ago. Uh, to me, an excellent illustration. I see Judas. Judas Iscariot, remember him? I see him in a different light. I, I, I used to think uh, of Judas uh, as uh, one of those uh, narrow-eyed, uh, little half-humpbacked individuals who are always sneaking around, you know, looking for some way to cheat you out of something. Okay? Uh, I, he, he was the ultimate of hypocrisy, Mike. Uh, Judas. This, this terrible man. But, but the more I've been reading lately, um, I, I've looked up Judas, and I decided that he really wasn't such a bad boy after all. Not in terms of uh, his behavior. Um, how, how, how do I arrive at that? Well, let, let me use a, a, an example. Um, when the disciples had gathered with Jesus in the upper room, okay? And, and the Lord, and <laughs> he's looking at me and say, I want to know about this Judas <laughs> you're talking about. I, I don't know him. Well, most of us don't. But let me tell you about it. And the other disciples, when, when Jesus makes the announcement, one of you all is getting ready to betray me, Okay? Now, now, if you read that story carefully, you'll notice something highly unusual. The other disciples that the Bible cites, every one of them said, it's not me, is it, Lord? Okay? Now, but there's a small modification when it comes to Judas. Judas says, is it me, Rabbi? Now, I would have looked right past that. But scholars tell me that's a major difference there. As I told you, rabbis were all over the place. In other words, Judas respected Jesus as a rabbi, as a good teacher, as a man with bona fide credentials, all right? The problem was Judas had never been transformed. He never had accepted Jesus as Lord in his life. Isn't that interesting? That here's a man simply because, now, mind you, the, the thing that really troubled me was Judas had actually seen everything Jesus had done. Judas was there when the Lord had healed the blind man. He saw it. He was part of it. I know folks who say to me, Pastor, and they're right. If you, if you could open a blind man's eye, if you could have a funeral and lay hands on the dead carcass and they jump up to life again, oh, everybody in town would come to your church. Our problem is that's not what really changes people's lives. Are you hearing me? Because Judas observed every kind of miracle that you can imagine. He saw Jesus do all of these wonders. He was right there, evidencing every bit of it, which tells me you can listen to truth, you can be informed of truth, you can study your Bible all day and all night, you can pray the other half of the day and night, and still not be a transformed individual. He learned how to conform. He slept with him. He ate with him. He traveled with him. He, they, that was his company. There's nothing that tells us 
Judas disappeared for weeks at a time and Jesus didn't know where he was. He was right there like everybody else. He listened to all the teaching. I've come to the conclusion, because the Lord had to help me, I've, I've always been puzzled. How can people who know so much Bible still live such raggedy lives? Knowledge is not salvation. You folk that show up for every Bible study, I used to think what wonderful people you are until I got to know you. And realize that every Bible student, just like every one of those rabbis in Israel, they were teachers of the law. They knew it backwards and forwards. They took Jesus out and crucified him. It, it causes me to tremble, to realize that folks who spend day and night studying God's word are not necessarily transformed individuals. They've not really been changed. It takes more than that. And we have to grasp it. Judas is our example of it. Well, let me finish up. Because I'm, 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 I'm coming to, to, to wish I had, you know, that I was, oh, the, wish I was 30 again so I could preach uh, this truth to the church. But the Lord knows he got preachers coming who will take care of all of that. I just need to understand it for my own good. And I told you Judas uh, heard every sermon Jesus uh, uh, preached. He saw blind eyes open. He saw the Lord raise the dead, heal the leper. He saw him cast out demons. Um, he saw power and love perfectly displayed by Jesus. In other words, if information and experience around Jesus was enough, the demons of hell would be disciples, you see. Because we have to learn, like Judas learned from Jesus, uh, he learned from Jesus' teaching, but he never allowed the truth to transform him. Jesus was still rabbi to Judas at the Lord's Supper, and not the Lord that Judas needed him to be in his life. I want to be one of his disciples. That's a, a, a nice phrase until you realize what it means, right? I want to be one of his disciples. That means I cannot merely give myself to prayer and Bible study. Those are important but I'm simply using them to say it's time for a new dimension in your life. It's time for us to begin. You say, well, Pastor, you, you, you didn't tell me enough about transformation. Come back next Sunday. I'll take it up and see if I can talk to you a little more about transformation. But when you make him Lord, you no longer are in control of your life. I say to you, sister, something like, and I want you uh, to uh, run around the church. Uh, that's God's will for your life. You say, my leg is bad, and I can't run. Uh, so my mind interprets for me what my stance should be. But when I am open to and sensitive to the word of God and the will of God coming. So often the things that we, somebody asked me, let me use myself, somebody asked me to sing a solo. I will let them know, you will never make me the laughing stock of this church. Okay? But just last Saturday morning, I, I sat with a family member of a woman who made me sing a solo 
in front of the whole church. And I did it well because I was just a kid, 12 years old. But she gave me the confidence to believe in myself that it could be done. Really, I still remember her. That was 70 years ago. Her name was Dolores Barber. And she believed in me and made me believe in myself. Lord, send Dolores again. <laughs> no. But that's the role Jesus is to have. And I look at people who every day somebody says to me, I can't do that. I won't do that. I know myself. And I know what they're telling me. They're telling me I'm saved. I've just never been transformed. I don't understand lordship. I like being in charge of my life. I don't want anybody, no preacher, no pastor, no teacher, no nobody's going to tell me what should be for my life. I know me better than anybody else knows me. But a disciple throws caution to the wind and says, Lord, here am I. Mold me, make me, change me, however you see fit, because you are Lord. You are Lord. I can break any shackle, not because I can break it, because you can. I believe there are some folks who want some shackles broken today. And I know a Lord, if you allow him to be Lord, who can set you free. Bow your heads if you will. I want to be one of your disciples one of your disciples. Now, we all know it requires the new birth. You gotta be born again. And I just sense somebody wants to be a disciple, but, but there's somebody here who wants to be a disciple. You gotta start with the new birth. You got to accept him as personal savior. He's gotta forgive you of your sins. He'll wash them all away, and he'll do it right here, right now. And so if there's anybody here this morning, I know there's somebody here this morning who desires the forgiveness that comes by that irreversible eraser called the Holy Spirit that covers my sin, wipes them entirely away, never to be remembered against me again. If anybody got sin you want covered, just stand up where you are. Stand up where you are right now. I, I got you. Bless you, my dear. Any other than just stand up right where you are. Time for genuine openness, honesty. Here, I got sin that needs to be washed by the blood of Jesus. Any other, just stand up right where you are. I, I, I'm just feeling today that, that, that that's it.